At the moment. What about the girlfriend you told me about? Shit. We're not. Together right now. Another smile. Oh. Really? I swallowed. The vodka was definitely having an effect now. I felt woozy, the pain in my chest less acute, and brave enough to suggest that Camellia take off her coat and sit down. Don't worry, she said. I won't stay too long. She hung her coat on the back of a chair. She was wearing a tight-fitting sweater and equally tight jeans. I imagined what Jake would have said about her. Hot Danny. Extremely fucking hot. It wasn't just how she looked, but the air of confidence and ironic humor that radiated from her. She had a feline way of moving. She licked her lips before taking another sip of her drink. I took a big gulp of mine. It's fine. Stay as long as you want. I'm glad of the company. Because of your shitty day. My eyes prickled. Now it came to it, I found I couldn't talk about Jake and what had happened. The words wouldn't squeeze past the obstruction in my throat. She didn't speak, just looked at me, waiting. Let's just say that it's nice not to be on my own. She raised her drink. Okay. Here's to the end of. A shitty day. We clinked glasses. I'll stay until the snow eases off, yes. She said. We both looked towards the window. The street light outside the flat illuminated the snow as it fell. There was no sign of it stopping. That might be tomorrow morning, I said. She lifted her glass to her lips and took another sip. Then I hope you have plenty of vodka. She paused. Don't worry, I'm not going to jump on you. The atmosphere in the room shifted, something crackling in the space between us. I felt nervous and excited. Camellia stood up and moved over to the bookcase, hips swaying as she walked. She examined the spines of the books, pulling out a guidebook that I'd bought before my and Laura's trip. The Rough Guide to Eastern Europe. She flicked through it. So tell me what happened to you in Romania. You had a bad experience. She came back towards me, leaning against the fireplace, the light catching the liquid in her glass. I was sitting on the sofa, looking up at her. I can't tell you, I said. Can't. I really felt drunk now, my head tight, the room tilting slightly. It might be too dangerous, I said. For you, I mean. In my drunken state, there was part of me that believed this. The police had told me Dr. Savage hadn't been murdered, but I felt uncharacteristically superstitious, Laura's words from earlier haunting me. What if there was something supernatural going on? A curse that meant that bad things happened to anyone I talked to about Romania. The moment I thought it, I dismissed it. A curse. It was ridiculous. That sounds intriguing, Camellia. Said. Ignore me. I'm just. Kidding. It didn't sound like you were joking. What was it? Her tone was light playful, but there was a serious look in her eye. Honestly, it doesn't matter. I wasn't being serious. Okay. If you say so. She went over to the window. This weather. Did you go to Bucharest? I was there two years ago, when we had so much snow it buried houses. I hope that doesn't happen here. She turned and there was a wicked glint in her eye. We'd be stranded, stuck here together. The breath felt thick in my lungs. That would be terrible. As long as we have enough vodka. I laughed. I think we're going to run out soon, the rate we're going. Too bad, Daniel. And what would we eat? I asked. She crossed the room, putting her almost empty glass down on the side. Table with a soft clunk. She stopped for a moment and then climbed onto the sofa. Her eyes searched my face and, drunk and craving human warmth, I reached out for her. She straddled me, kissing me, her tongue slipping between my lips, her hands holding my face. I kissed her back. Like before, there was the faintest trace of cigarettes in her mouth, plus the smell of perfume lingering on her skin. I slipped my hands up the back of her sweater and pulled her closer, her breasts pressing against my chest through the fabric of our clothes. She felt warm now, heated from the inside by alcohol. I was so drunk that I didn't stop to think about how surreal this was. Him, she said, smiling into my mouth. I felt breathless. Bedroom. No, here is good. 
She pulled her sweater off over her head, revealing a red push-up bra and a tattoo on her upper arm. She unbuttoned my shirt and I shrugged it off then took off my t-shirt. My erection strained against my underwear. She reached down into my lap and unbuttoned my jeans, shuffling back slightly and freeing my cock, wrapping her fist around it. She leaned forward and kissed me deeply, raking my chest with the fingernails of her free hand. I closed my eyes, and found myself imagining that she was Laura. We had made love on this sofa many times. Lost in the drunken moment, lips against mine, I could believe that Laura had come back to me. Tell me your secrets, Daniel, she whispered into my mouth. I tried to keep kissing her but she pulled back so our lips were barely touching. Have you ever broken the law? What? Her hand still stroked my cock. I was close to coming already. She must have sensed this, taking her hand away and wriggling closer, the fabric of her jeans pressing against my naked flesh. I want you to talk to me, Daniel. Tell me. Something illegal. It. Excites me. She kissed me again, quickly, then broke away. I opened my eyes too. Find her peering at me intently, a smile on her lips. I don't understand, I said. Come on. Don't be shy. She pulled back, examining my face. She pressed her crotch against my cock. I could feel how warm she was through the denim. She stroked my chest and leaned forward again. You must have done something to break the law, she said, breathing into my ear. Was this really what turned her on? I wanted to comply so she wouldn't stop but I couldn't think of anything. I had stolen a pencil once from Argos but I doubted that would turn her on. She rubbed against me and kissed my neck, raked her fingernails across my chest again. Come on. Something illegal. You must have broken the law, Daniel. No. I don't believe you. Come on, tell me. I could feel Jake's presence in the room, laughing, telling me to make something up. But I felt so pissed, so confused. All I wanted was oblivion, for this woman to keep kissing me and touching me. I wanted to lose myself in her, in my fantasy that she was Laura. But suddenly I felt cold, my erection waning. She felt this and reached down, touching me again. Come on, she said, sounding impatient now. Tell me something bad. Maybe something you and your girlfriend did together. Or maybe something you haven't done yet. I was thoroughly confused now. Camellia, I don't think. Dot single quote. She looked into my eyes intently, like she was trying to search my brain. Then she sighed and climbed off me, standing up and peering down at me. I'm sorry, I said. Whatever. She picked up her sweater and put it back on. She looked at me with contempt. I hurriedly buttoned up my jeans, looked for my t-shirt. I was freezing now, and felt sick. Where did I put the phone? She said to herself, scouring the room. Outside, a car alarm went off, and the noise shook me out of the almost fugue state I was in. I stared at her. There was something familiar about her, something I'd seen since our first encounter. What was all that about? She shrugged. Have you been here before? In my flat. She rolled her eyes. I think you're paranoid, Daniel. Of course I haven't been here before. She found the phone and tucked it away in her jeans pocket. She headed towards the door. Before she went, she turned towards the window and took in the snow that continued to pummel the city. Fuck this country, she said, and left. Chapter 30. Laura noticed the man watching her on her second circuit of the park, but as soon she looked towards him he turned his attention to a woman walking her greyhound. She had needed to get out of the house, to get some air. Not only were the walls of her room closing in on her but the inside of her head itched like there were hundreds of baby spiders crawling about in her skull, feathery legs tickling her brain. She couldn't sit still. She went into the garden to look for Alina but she wasn't there. Since that night at the hospital, Alina had visited her here several times, shimmering between the bare trees. But she only came at night, it seemed. 
Although the path around the park was mostly clear of snow, patches of black ice lurked like land mines, and Laura had watched a fellow walker thump to the ground before her, eliciting a chorus of laughter from a group of children having a snowball fight nearby. Laura had paused to help the fallen man to his feet before pushing on feeling his eyes on her back. On her third circuit, she tried not to look directly at the man. He was a pensioner, in his sixties, or perhaps a fit-looking seventy. He was broad and ruddy, wrapped in a wool coat and wearing a black hat and gloves. And he was definitely watching her, but in the same way she was watching him, surreptitiously, pretending to be looking past her. She stole another glance at the man. The air around him appeared to waver, like he was giving off heat, and something struck her like a punch in the chest, making her gasp. He wasn't a man. He was a devil. She entered a thicket of trees and he was obscured from view. She stopped and caught her breath. Are you okay? She looked up. A young woman in a black woolen hat was regarding her with concern. You were talking out loud. I just wanted to check you're okay. She had an accent, German, Laura thought. A native Londoner would never have asked if she was all right. They would have assumed she was a nutcase or a drunken given her a wide berth. She beckoned to the German woman. Follow me. The woman. Hesitated but followed Laura to the edge of the thicket. Over there, she said, as they emerged from between the trees. There's a devil sitting over there. She pointed over to the bench. The German gopped at her with alarm. There was no one there. You need me to call someone. The woman asked. Laura couldn't react. She stared at the empty space where the devil had been sitting, tuning out the woman's questions. She felt dizzy. What if he was another ghost? Only yesterday, on her way. Home from the Tate Modern, when she had felt the need to get away from Daniel, she thought she'd glimpsed Beatrice again for the first time in twenty years. She had been standing beneath a lamppost in the snow, and Laura had stopped dead. Beatrice looked so unhappy, her face accusatory. It was the expression of someone who had been betrayed. But when Laura stepped towards her, she vanished. Was this what was going to happen now? She had unlocked the doors of perception, was she going to start seeing ghosts and devils everywhere? Was she going to become a magnet for the unliving? She scuttled away from the thicket of trees, leaving the German woman standing open-mouthed, and hurried towards the park gates. She needed to get to the safety of her room before any other ghosts came looking for her. As soon as Laura unlocked the door of Rob and Aaron's home, Aaron called out, Rob. No, it's me. Oh. Laura went into the kitchen, casting a glance over her friend's shoulder, hoping that Alina would be waiting for her at the end of the garden so she could tell her about the devil in the park. Her attention snapped to Aaron, who was pacing up and down alongside the table, blowing out breaths like a two-year-old attacking the candles on a birthday cake. Laura wanted to go to bed, to wait until dark so she could talk to Alina. Wanted to pull the covers over her head and block the world out. I'm in labor, Aaron said. I've been trying to call Rob but he's not. Answering. She gasped. Fuck. I knew this baby was going to come early. Aaron's words seemed to come from a great distance away. Laura. Wake up. Did you hear me? I. Dot single quote. Laura tried to stay calm. Have you called the hospital? Are they going to send an ambulance? Aaron's laugh was cut short by a contraction. Aw. Oh. No, they don't do that. Unless it's an emergency. Isn't this an emergency? Not yet. Oh, shit, I've been waiting for Rob. He wants to be the one to take me to the hospital. But I can't wait any longer. I called a cab but they said it would take an hour because of the fucking inclement weather. She grimaced and blew out air. I'm assuming you don't want to be the one to deliver the baby. No. God, no. Aaron studied her curiously. My God, you should see your face. It's all right. But you're going to have to drive me. I. But I don't have a car. Laura felt like she was being dive-bombed by black birds. They swooped about her, screeching, drowning out Aaron's words. Well, duh. Aaron snatched her own car key from the hook on the wall. 
We'll take mine. Laura stared at her. Come on. My bag's in the hallway. Still, Laura hesitated. For fuck's sake, Laura. If we don't get a move on, you are going to have to deliver the baby. Aaron ushered her out the door and they headed for Aaron's golf. The front and back windows were covered with snow, but the road was clear. Aaron handed Laura a scraper and a can of de-icer before getting into the back of the car. As Laura removed the snow and ice, she told herself repeatedly not to panic, to ignore the birds that flapped about her head. They weren't real. This was real. She needed to help her friend and her baby. Okay, she hadn't driven a car for over a year. The streets would be liable to bear the same patches of black ice as the path in the park. And snow had begun to fall lightly again, the sky dimming like someone had thrown a muslin square over the sun. What if they crashed? What if Laura killed Aaron and, even worse, the baby inside her? She thought of her bed, the cozy darkness. That's where she wanted to be. Where she needed to be. She opened the door to tell Aaron she couldn't do it. Aaron was lying on the back seat, her face scrunched up, timing the gaps between contractions on her iPhone. I can't, Laura began. Aaron glared at her. Just. Fucking. Drive. Laura got behind the wheel and started the engine. Chapter 31. Baby arrived at 10.15 last night. Oscar James Tranham, 8LB40Z. Aaron was brilliant. Oscar is amazing. The text from Rob was accompanied of a picture of a tiny, pink-faced infant in a transparent plastic cot, wearing a crocheted white hat. Then a separate text arrived a few seconds later. Mate, Laura was a hero. She drove Aaron to the hospital through the snow. Got there just in time. So while I'd almost been having sex with a Romanian woman, Laura had been pacing up and down outside the maternity ward, waiting for Aaron to give birth. It added to my sense of shame. What had I been thinking? But layered over the shame was something worse, fear. The questions she had asked, wanting me to tell her my secrets. Was it just sex play, or something more? And if it was something more, what was she trying to get from me? She was Romanian. Was there any way she could know what had happened in the forest? Or was she trying to find out? I wanted badly to cling to the belief that Camilla's words had been part of a game, the equivalent to asking someone to talk dirty, and that her being Romanian was a coincidence. But as soon as she had left I had checked the CCTV video of the intruders with the dog, studying the shape of the female intruder's body. Slim, small breasts, a hint of blonde hair beneath the hood she wore. The more I studied the video and replayed our encounter in my mind, the more convinced I became. Camellia was the female intruder. And that probably, almost certainly, meant she was one of the burglars who had taken then returned my laptop. I paced the flat as I thought it through. She had followed me to Jake's gig, tried to seduce me then, for whatever reason. She must have dropped her phone deliberately, knowing I would take it home, not realizing I would switch it off. I had no memory of turning it back on, probably because she had done so when she came into my flat with the dog. I felt cold and shaken. Why was she following me? Why had she broken in? Had she been trying to kill me? Was it connected to what had happened to Laura and me in Romania, and if so, how? I felt sober now, as sober as if I'd never touched a drop of alcohol in my life. I could still feel the echo of Camilla's body against mine, could still taste her on my lips. But who was she? And what the hell did she want? The next morning I went out for a long walk, then decided to take the bus home. There was a man my age on the top deck with three small children who were acting like they were full of e-numbers and sugar. Every time he got one of them under control, another would run off shrieking down the bus, or start banging on the windows. I watched him as he eventually gave up, letting them do what they liked as he stared at his phone, pretending they weren't his, probably wondering how his life had got like this. I empathized, except my toddlers were in my head. Every time I felt like I'd got a grip on one problem, another, Jake, Laura, the break-ins and Camellia, would run screaming into the forefront of my mind. 
Like the dad on this bus, all I wanted to do was sit and stare at something unconnected to my problems, to hide from everything, switch my brain off. But I forced myself to stay switched on. I remembered something Lori used to do when she was overwhelmed at work. She would sit and write everything that was bothering her on a sheet of paper, get everything out. Then she would put it into priority order, bearing in mind the consequences if she didn't tackle each particular issue. A common technique, but one I seldom used. Now was the perfect time to start. I didn't have any paper with me, so used my phone, tapping words in a stream of consciousness into the notes app. Laura left me, crazy, ghosts, want her back. Jake, suicide. Who is Camellia? What does she want? Health, sleep, alcohol. PTSD. This was it. The total of my problems on a single phone screen. Studying the list, it struck me that it could be displayed in a different way, as a mind map. Romania would be in a circle in the center, with lines leading to all the other problems. Unless Jake's death shortly after I'd started telling him about my experiences was a coincidence, everything stemmed from that night. The thought of somebody pushing Jake from the bridge made me clench my fists, a red mist swirling around me. The anger must have been evident on my face because one of the errant preschoolers saw me and ran off crying to his dad, saying something about the scary man. So far, ever since getting back from Romania, I had allowed things to happen to me, a passive victim. Even my attempts to win Laura back had been ineffectual. Installing the security cameras had only led to more questions. It was time to change. To be active. I needed to find out. Exactly what was going on. But how? The first step, surely, was to find Camellia. I didn't know exactly how I was going to do that but if. I could track her down, I could make her tell me what she knew. There had to be a way to find her. But I didn't know anything about her, her surname, where she lived, what she did. What was I supposed to do, wander around London looking for her? I could, I supposed, sit and wait for her to make her next move. Surely there would be one. But I wasn't going to do that. I needed to get the upper hand. As I approached my flat, I saw the fox, tearing into a bin bag that, yet again, one of my neighbors had left on the pavement. It had crept out beneath the cover of twilight and dug out a KFC box, scattering chicken bones and half-chewed corn on the cobs across the entrance of the building. Sick of the mess, I shouted, hey! And broke into a run, chasing it up the street until it vanished into a garden and shot round the back of somebody else's house. Indoors, I went straight to my laptop and onto Google. I typed in Private Detective London. There were over one million results, although of course the vast majority of these would be junk. I skimmed through the listings. Most of the private detectives listed specialized in finding out if your partner was cheating, checking up on employees or tracking down debtors. Grim stuff. I was looking for someone who had experience finding people. Clicking onto the various private detective sites, most of which looked like they were designed in 1998, made my sense of determination leak away. I could just pick one at random and hope they were competent, but there had to be a better way of finding the right person to help me, especially as I felt the need to find Camellia quickly. Trying a different tactic, I filtered the results so they showed only news stories, expanding my search to Private Detective London Missing. I wanted to find a news story about an investigator who'd been successful finding a missing person. Again, most of the results were completely unhelpful, but after clicking through a dozen pages I found a news story from the summer, something that had taken place while Laura and I were on our grand tour. I read through the story. A young Eastern European woman, from Belarus, had been reported missing by her employer. A private detective, based in Kentish Town, not far from here, had discovered what happened to her. It was a dark tale involving London's immigrant population, illegal employment practices and rough sex gone wrong. The investigator had discovered the truth before handing the case over to the police. 
His name was Edward Rooney and his website consisted of a single page, filled with basic information and a couple of glowing testimonials, and a contact form. I completed the form and hit send before I could change my mind. Chapter 32 Edward Rooney's office was on the second floor of a dirty white building in a Kentish town side street. The street was half scuzzy, half gentrified, there was a betting shop next to a trendy coffee place. The snow here had been cleared from the roads and pavements and it was warmer today, rain in the forecast. By the end of the day the snow would all be gone. Aaron and Rob lived a 10-minute walk from here. I knew from looking at Rob's Facebook page that they were home from the hospital and Rob had already shared a dozen photos of little Oscar and an exhausted but happy-looking Aaron. Laura was in one of the photos too, holding the baby in her arms. I tried to read the expression in her eyes, saw sadness behind her smile. If everything had gone to plan, she'd be heavily pregnant now. We'd be spending our weekends shopping for pushchairs and decorating the nursery. I tried to push this from my mind as I rang the buzzer. Maybe after this I would call round to see them. The baby gave me the perfect excuse. Of course, I was keen to meet Oscar, wanted to congratulate the proud parents, but really I wanted to see Laura, whom I hadn't contacted since losing her at the gallery. I had vowed to give her time, deal with everything else first, get answers, before trying again to win her back. But when it came to Laura, I was an addict. I couldn't help myself. I was buzzed in and went up a narrow staircase that smelled of mildew and years of cigarette smoke. A young, punkish woman waited for me, holding the office door open. She reminded me a little of Alina, the way she dressed, the spiky attitude. The big difference was that this woman was still alive. I'm Sophie Carpenter, Edward's assistant, she said, looking me up and down. He's with another client at the moment but you can wait here. I sat on an uncomfortable chair and Sophie offered me coffee. When I said no, it was okay, she sat back down behind her computer, chin cupped in her hand, tapping at the keyboard with one long black fingernail. The desk was open underneath, giving me a clear view of her rather wicked-looking black leather boots, the toe of one of them tapping along with her typing as though keeping time. I fidgeted on the chair. Ten minutes passed. I needed the loo and asked Sophie where it was. When I came back, a man I assumed to be Edward Rooney was seeing another man out of the office. Another client, I guessed, one with white hair, though I could only see his back. The older man went down the stairs and Edward Rooney turned around. Daniel Sullivan. He introduced himself. He was tall, in his early forties, I guessed, with black hair that contained a number of gray streaks and bags under his eyes. He was tall, over six foot, and was dressed in a suit that had probably once been smart but that was now shiny at the elbows and knees. Sophie, have you offered this gentleman coffee? Yeah, she said, not looking up from her screen. He didn't want any. How about tea? Did you offer him tea? She rolled her eyes. It's fine, I said. I don't want anything. Just your help. He nodded, his expression serious, and gestured for me to follow him into his tiny office. Once we were both sitting down, either side of his desk, I saw that the room was full. There was a tiny window with pigeon deterrent spikes visible on the sill. His desk was piled high with paperwork. He pulled a laptop out from beneath this pile and flipped it open. I looked you up, he said, after you called yesterday. You're an app. Developer. I was keen to skip the preamble. I need you to find somebody for. Me. He looked at me over the lid of the laptop, shoved it aside and grabbed a notepad. I was about to go through my introductory spiel but you seem like a man on a mission. Why don't you start from the beginning? I sighed. I don't know if I can do that. Do I need to do that? Can't I just tell you what I know about this person I'm looking for, and then have you find her? Mr. Sullivan. Please call me Daniel. Daniel, the more information you give me, the more chance I have of being able to help you. 
Even if Camelia was connected to what had happened to Laura and me in Romania, I didn't see the need to tell Edward Rooney about it couldn't see how it could help. In fact, it would probably confuse matters. The woman I need you to find is called Camelia. She's Romanian, in her mid-twenties, possibly a bit older. Blonde, very attractive. Speaks excellent English and told me she's been in London for a couple of years. She uses a Blackberry phone, has a tattoo and wears false fingernails and chunky silver rings. Um, on her left hand. He looked up at me from his notes. Is that all? Yeah. I met her in a pub, at a gig, and... Dot single quote. Hang on. I need to know why you need to find her. Why? Yes. Daniel, I only take on missing persons cases where I know my client doesn't intend to cause the person he's looking for any harm. I also need to know whether there are any legal ramifications. I've had men here asking me to look for their ex-wives who left them because they were being battered. I've had gangsters looking for women they've trafficked to escaped. I don't take cases like that. I don't mean her any harm, I said. I want to stop her from doing me harm. Okay. So. Tell me what you know. You met her in a pub. Dot single quote. There was nothing for it but to give him at least some information. I spent the next 15 minutes telling him the story of what had happened over the last week, starting with the break-in. I felt myself turning pink as I told him about my encounter with Camellia the evening before last. She kept asking me if I'd done anything illegal. When I couldn't come up with anything, she got angry and left. Any idea what she wanted you to tell her? None at all. He laid his pen down. Daniel, if we can figure out the connection between you, it will make it easier to find her. Are you sure you have no idea? I hesitated. I genuinely didn't know what Camellia had wanted me to say, and still thought it might simply be her equivalent of talking dirty. The only possible connection I could think of was Romania, but I really didn't want to tell this person I'd just met about that. I hadn't even been able to tell my therapist. The only person I'd felt able to tell, after a huge internal struggle, was Jake, and he died before I could finish the story. Thinking about Jake made my eyes sting and I looked up to see Edward looking at me curiously. I honestly have no idea. He leaned across the desk, elbows resting on scattered paperwork. I'm sorry, but I don't believe you. What? He sat back. I can't take your case, Daniel. Not unless you're completely open with me. There's no point. You might as well go. I opened my mouth, shut it again, aware that I must look like a stranded goldfish. There was a voice in my head screaming, tell him, just tell him. But when I opened my mouth again no words came out. I simply couldn't do it. My frustration with myself transformed into anger with Edward Rooney. There were plenty more private detectives out there. Hundreds of them in London. I'd find someone who didn't need to know everything, who would just take my money and do what I asked. I stood up. Fine. I'll find someone else. Good luck. I pulled open the door and stomped out into the reception area until I stood behind Sophie's desk. She swiveled her chair, the wheels squeaking, and, seeing my thunderous expression, asked, everything all right? No. Your boss is a... At that moment, the front door of the office opened. A man stood there, framed by the doorway. It took me a moment to realize he was wearing a balaclava. The other details only came back to me afterwards, in his hand he held a bottle, three quarters filled with a clear liquid, a rag attached to the neck of the bottle. There was a cigarette lighter in his other hand. Chapter 33. Get down. I yelled, leaping at Sophie and pulling her off her chair onto the floor just as the man threw the now flaming bottle into the room and slammed the door shut. The bottle shattered on the floor in the center of the office and exploded with an immense, deafening blast of heat and light. I'd piled in next to Sophie behind a tall filing cabinet beside her desk. When I peered around it, I found the center of the small room engulfed in a ball of flame. I have played enough video games in my life to recognize a Molotov cocktail. Within seconds the room was filled with fire and thick black smoke. 
I could barely open my eyes, couldn't breathe, was choking on a lungful of smoke. Almost blind, I figured the door was only ten feet away, her desk between it and us. Remembering seeing Sophie's spiky, knee-high black boots from the other side, I knew the desk was open underneath. The quickest and safest route out had to be under it. Squinting from behind the cabinet, I could see the flames spreading, engulfing the two-seater sofa and the bookcase, licking at the edge of the desk. The heat in the room was indescribable. I felt like my insides were cooking. We had to get out. Now. Go. I managed to gasp, pulling Sophie out from behind the cabinet and shoving her forward. The desk, I said. Go under. Coughing, guarding her face with a forearm, she crawled like a three-legged dog to the desk and disappeared beneath it. I followed her, though I could hardly see her. It was hot as a blast furnace under there and I thought this is it. I'm going to die. But then I was out the other side and the door was open and someone was shouting, pulling Sophie through first, then me. I fell onto the carpet in the corridor, which was full of people, yelling and gesticulating. Looking back into the office, I watched as through the wall of smoke a shape appeared, Edward standing in the doorway of his inner office, grappling with a fire extinguisher which didn't appear to work. The flames, which had reached the desk now, consuming the papers that lay beside the computer, were blocking Edward's exit. More people, from other offices in the building, had appeared in the corridor. Sophie lay on the floor beside me, gasping for breath. Is there another way out? I asked, my throat burning, eyes stinging. The only window I'd seen in Edward's office was tiny. I've called the fire brigade, said a black woman with an air of competence. She shouted at Edward, get back in your office, shut the door, find something to block the bottom of the door. Not paper. Edward stared at us over the flames then retreated into his office, slamming the door. Who the fuck was it? Sophie said, pushing herself into a sitting position. Her voice was hoarse, her eyes pink and watery. Everybody in the corridor was staring at us. I pushed myself to my feet, surprised to find I felt okay, apart from my desperate anxiety about Edward, trapped in his office, the flames beating against the door, hoping he'd managed to find something to block the space beneath it to stop smoke pouring through. And a question pulsated in my head, was this my fault? In his line of work, I assumed Edward must upset numerous people. Husbands who'd been exposed as cheats. Employees caught with their hands in the till. But so much disaster had followed me lately, the evil from that house. It followed us home. That I couldn't help but think this was down to me. That someone was trying to stop me from telling Edward my story. But who? Camellia. No, the person who threw the Molotov was definitely male. Camella's companion, assuming it was her, from the CCTV video. As Sophie sat and sobbed beside me, black mascara streaking her face, I hugged myself, shivering despite the heat that emanated from the burning room. A minute later, I heard the blessed sound of sirens and the fire brigade arrived, several of them running up the stairs, clearing us out of the building. I stood on the street and watched as they did their work, putting out the fire. The police were there too, and an ambulance which Sophie was sitting in the back of now, an oxygen mask clamped to her face. I felt fine, had somehow breathed in less smoke than her. Please God, I prayed silently, let Edward be okay. I can't be responsible for another death. Please.